This presentation is about unsafe situations, regulations, and standards. You are expected to know all of these in both your assessment and for your exams. So the Gas Industry Unsafe Procedure, the GIUSP, is a guidance document you get issued with it or you can buy it when you become a gas safe engineer. Your gas school should provide you with some so that you can see them and they will certainly be present in your assessment. In addition to this there's always a copy of them in your gas book, in your Viper book or your Blue Flame book. There's always a, a copy of them anyway. The important thing is these get updated you'll be notified when you're a gas engineer that there's an update and you'll that you'll have to get the new version um, or technical bulletins will come out giving you updates where you've got to change you stick your, your technical bulletin into your current copy now what it does is it details how to deal with unsafe situations based on the level of risk that is posed to occupiers of the premises. So it grades the risks according to how dangerous they are. The four laws that you work under as a gas engineer are the gas safety installation use regulations, the gas safety management regulations, the gas safety rights of entry regulations, and RIDOR, the Reporting of Injuries, Diseases and Dangerous Occurrences Regulations. I'm only going to really talk about the, the first one and the last one because they're the ones that A, you get asked about uh, on your course and in, in your tests and they're the two most important ones for a practical gas engineer. The GSIUR tells you that where a person performs work on a gas appliance, he shall immediately thereafter examine the effectiveness of the flue, the ventilation, the operating pressure or heat input, that's gas rating, or where necessary both, and the operation of the appliance to make sure that it's safe. That includes operating the safety controls, uh, the flue and ventilation gas rates, and burner pressures. Make sure they are all correct. A gas engineer has a duty of care to take all reasonably practical steps, reasonably practical steps, to notify any defect and unsafe situation to the responsible person. If you're working in a premises and the RP is not there, the responsible person is not there, you can't find them, you're contracting out, there's nothing you can do about that. But you, as long as you've taken reasonable steps, then you're covered. Right, how do you respond to unsafe situations? When an unsafe situation has been reported to the responsible person, you must record it on the appropriate paperwork, I'll show you the paperwork later on, and ensure that the appliance or installation is correctly labelled. Remember, you've only got to label it if you haven't fixed the problem. All this really is around a problem that you haven't fixed and you've had to, and you've had to walk away from the job. Right, reporting to Riddle, you've certainly got questions on this. Right, you you have to report to RIDOR if you see stuff that has been carried out by a previous gas engineer that's dangerous. So, for example, a serious gas escape caused by poor workmanship or the wrong materials being used. I'll give you a good example of this. Uh, I certainly know of a case where somebody, a gas fitter, uh, or somebody had come in to fix the gas, 
and had used garden hose instead of copper pipe to connect up a gas fire. Right, if you come across a defective flue where the combustion products of combustion are not completely cleared, that's a badly designed flue. For example, a um, an open flue with a 90 degree bend in it. It's illegal and it won't allow the products of combustion to clear. Again, badly designed, bad workmanship. If somebody's fitted a fluid gas appliance but hasn't put the flue on. So if you've got an open fluid boiler with no flue sitting on the top of it. Again, these things happen. They happen because people who haven't gone through the course that you've that you're doing, haven't taken their qualifications, don't actually know what they're doing, and you're going to come across a lot of this when you're out there. Uh, you report it to Ridor so that Ridor will then go and investigate the person who did that bad bit of workmanship, dangerous workmanship, and try to prevent them working on gas. If, a, if uh, an appliance has been fitted but there's inadequate ventilation in the room, again, bad workmanship, somebody that's not been trained. Where you find safety devices that have been either made inoperative or bypassed. For example, a flame supervision device being wedged open. Again, untrained people will go in, they'll see the problem, they'll do a little fix on it by breaking or bypassing the safety device, um, which leaves, leaves it immediately dangerous. But you need to let Ridor know about this because there's somebody out there that's doing this and they'll cause somebody to die at some stage. The last one is a fitting that you have seen that is not fit for purpose. If you go and buy a fitting and you come back and you've bought it perhaps on the cheap or you've bought it from, from somewhere um, that you don't usually buy things and you, you can see or you know that this fitting is not fit for purpose for gas, then you need to contact Ridor and say, listen, I've bought this fitting, this is the type it is, it's not fit for gas, and they will investigate the company uh, and see what's going on. So that's your Ridor side of things. Here's the, um, here's the forms that you, do, you fill in, they're all done online now. Um, flammable gas incident and report of a dangerous gas fitting very simple forms to fill in you send them off and they do all the rest it's no real work for you but it needs to be done it's important that it gets done to get cowboys out of the gas industry and leave professional gas engineers like yourself who know what they're doing know what all the rules are um, to carry out the jobs so dealing with gas emergencies your responsibilities and your advice to people whether you're on site or whether you're off site, you may need to offer advice to a gas user. It might be they give you a telephone call and say, oh, I can smell gas, or oh, this has happened. So if the gas user reports they can smell gas, you should say to them, turn off the ECV, switch off or, or turn off anything that will cause any ignition, blow out candles, there's a good one, and open the windows to reduce the amount of gas in the house if the leak's in the house. Open the windows, open the doors, that's the advice you're going to give them. Right? You're also going to tell them not to operate any electrical switches. If the electrical switches are on, don't turn them off. It creates sparks, right? Blow out candles, open the, open the windows, open the doors. Turn off the ECV. When you're on site and you're either informed of or you smell gas, turn off the ECV, extinguish all naked flames, inform everyone not to operate switches on or off, ventilate the property, 
and then once you've done all that and got everybody safe test the installation for gas tightness however under this situation and here's a great exam question and a great assessment question under that situation right you are not allowed any pressure drop on your tightness test normally you've got your permitted permissible drop it can be four it could be six millibars could be up to eight millibars depending on the meter however in these circumstances where somebody's reported the smell of gas or you've noticed the smell of gas then you are not permitted any drop at all in a tightness test please remember that I guarantee it will come up so your priority is in a gas emergency your priority is to safeguard life first and then property you've got to secure the escape of people who are at risk and your responsibility is to leave the site safe you don't just run away and leave the leak you've got to do something about it turn off the ECV trace the leak that sort of thing so what actions should you take so if you come across a dangerous situation or an unsafe situation explain to the gas user or the responsible person that the installation or appliance is in your opinion immediately dangerous we're going to go for here and must be disconnected from the gas supply until the situation has been rectified okay now they're bearing in mind this is if you can't fix it if you're having to walk off the job if you come across uh, an immediately dangerous situation and you need to go to the shop to get some equipment or get uh, a part that's when you must put your labels up inform the are uh, the responsible person etc if you come across a situation and you can fix it there and then just fix it and then do all your tests and you don't have to go through all this um, all this rigmarole it's only if you're having to leave it or you can't repair it immediately at the time so if you have to go attach a suitably worded do not use warning label complete a warning notice I'll show you one of them later on ask the gas user or RP to sign it as a record of receipt if they don't want to sign it they don't have to sign it right on there saying would not sign some people get shirty about all this okay some people don't want you to cut their gas off and permission is everything here with permission immediately disconnect and seal the appliance and or the installation with an appropriate fitting you've got to have the, the householder the resident the responsible person's permission to cut their gas off if they don't give you permission you immediately contact the gas emergency contact center and the details will be on the meter immediately contact them say I found an immediately dangerous situation but the householder refuses to let me deal with it or cut the gas off I promise you they'll be around there within 10 minutes and they'll put the door in they have rights of entry well above anything you've got uh, they've got better rights of entry in many cases than the police so leave it to them they'll come and they'll deal with it that's if the RP or the householder the resident will not let you address an immediately dangerous situation uh, in the correct manner so what is an immediately dangerous situation where you find an installation or an appliance that would cause an immediate danger that is dangerous now which cannot be rectified right normally if you come across a situation that's dangerous now you're going to fix it now but if it can't be rectified you must attach the relevant warning labels and complete a notice of immediate danger you must seek the permission of the customer to do this I've just spoken about that 
the do not use warning label must be securely attached to the appliance and on completion of disconnection immediately complete a notice of immediate danger and only the operative who carried out the disconnection is to sign the notice. The other category of unsafe situation, there are only two categories, immediately dangerous and at risk. An at risk appliance is one where one or more faults exist and if operated may in the future constitute a danger to life or property. So for example, if you've got a, an, a, an oven uh, built into a worktop and you notice that it's burning round the, uh, the 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 wood the combustible material either side of the of the cooker is starting to get scorched from the heat of the cooker that's an at risk situation it's not immediately going to kill anybody but given time it's going to set fire to the worktop if it carries on for a long period of time so you should again, where possible and with the gas user's permission, you should try to rectify the appliance to make it safe to use. So you ask them, you say to them, look, this is at risk. Can I fix it for you? I advise you that I, it needs fixed. <coughs> if they say yes, obviously you fix it. If you can't fix it at the time, if this isn't possible, explain to the the person that the appliance is in your opinion at risk and should not be used right not must not be used should not be used that's at risk the last one and the one where the confusion generally comes in is not to current standards this is not part of the unsafe situations procedure because not to current standards is not an unsafe situation. It's just something is not conforming to the standards of today, although it probably conformed to them when it was built, I don't know, 20 years ago. Right? So you've got to be aware of this, and it's a classification you can use. It's a requirement that gas installations meet standards and comply with the law that is applicable at the time of installation. So if something was fitted in 1962 in one of these old houses in Enfield somewhere, um, it was legal in 1962. It will be legal now as long as it's working fine. It's just not to the standards we would use nowadays. When changes to the laws have occurred, those installations are considered safe for continued use. You should assess existing installations, so that's an installation that you go to that's older, against the current standards, what you would expect to find nowadays, and providing it's operating safely, here we go, it's down to you, you can make a judgment about the advice to give the gas user. You may also have to make a judgment and deem if the appliance is operating safely. And then if it's operating safely, but it's just not to current standards, you just classify it as NCS, not to current standards. If there are lots of not to current standards, then it can escalate to an at-risk or an immediately dangerous situation. So, not to current standard categories. Category 1 is one or more flueing and or ventilation situations. The effectiveness of flues has got better over the years. Ventilation requirements have got larger over the years. So it may be you go to somewhere and there's a, a really old-fashioned flu, which definitely isn't to current standards, 
the ventilation is to a standard from a long time ago and you think well the combination of these two things is going to be dangerous I'm going to I'm going to move this up to an at risk that's your call right uh, a category 2 is a not current standard situation that actually contravenes the gas safety rules and category 3 is other not current standard situations where the industry standards have changed since the original installation but the appliance is operating safely they, they, more or less this is what you're going to find old stuff um, running old rules but it's still working safely and it's working fine now you must notify the gas user of any category 1 and 2 NCSs for category 3 NCSs use your judgment on deciding whether to report or not it would be good practice to say look this is not to current standards if we wouldn't do this nowadays we would consider this as if it was fitted today as dangerous so what would you like me to do about it would you like me to um, to give you something more modern or blah 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 it's, it's up to you right and particularly if you find a category 1 and 2 NCS or 1 or 2 SCS it's recommended that you write an advice note you leave them a proper gas advice note and then you're covered if anything happens we only use one notice for gas when you when it's ID and you've shut shut it off we use that danger safety warning do not use straightforward if you need to use it that's the one to use now onto the GSI UR itself it's a booklet I'll show you some some pages from it in a second but you have three columns you have the situation and you you go through the I'll show you what it means but you go through it it then tells you the category ID or at risk or NCS and then there might be little notes written about it just to clarify things that might be confusing however with the categories please be aware that there are two types of at risk those where turning off the gas makes a difference and those where turning off the gas makes no difference there are two types of AR the in in the GSI UR book it lets you know that because it writes them in red italics okay you, if you read the the notes there it tells you exactly what happens but I am going to explain to you about an at-risk situation where turning off the gas will make no difference to the safety of the installation here's an example you've got a plastic pipe which should never be above ground because sunlight destroys the plastic plastic pipe exposed above the ground this is classified as at risk but it's also classified as in in the in the book as not having any not being made any difference if you turn off the ECV it will make no difference to the safety of the installation so you don't need to use a do not use label in these cases you need to use them if turning off the gas will make a difference where turning off the gas does not make a difference you do not need to issue a do not use label so here's an actual page from the GSI UR as it shows situation category should you contact Ridor right the rules and then notes so let's pick on one here let's do a gas escape and here's an important one for your exam and for your assessment um, downstream of the ECV you've got a gas escape which is either outside of the tolerance of your tightness test so the drop has been too much for your tightness test 
it's immediately dangerous or your tightness test is passed but you can smell gas that again is immediately dangerous all right so you could pass a tightness test but if you smell gas it's still immediately dangerous let's look at another one we'll look down the bottom at not current standard no protective equipotential bonding I'm sure your tutors have told you about equipotential bonding um, no no equipotential bonding at the meter you know yourself you've seen them all bonded it's one of the checks you do prior to a tightness test uh, and what you do then is there's not a lot, lot you can do you're not an electrician all you do is inform the responsible person that the equipotential bonding should be carried out by an electrically competent person so there's no more to do than that write an advice notice and um, and and you're done so this is what a warning or advice notice looks like they tend to come like this this is a core a, a gas safe one okay and you've got your immediately dangerous section up there you've got your at risk section below it and you're not to current standards situation below that and you just fill in the appropriate um, section thank you very much for watching I hope this has helped you if you've got any questions leave them in the comments or go to my website and the link for that is in the description below Good luck with your exams and I'll speak to you in the next.